Good afternoon. My name is Martha Nowak, and I want to welcome you on behalf of K-State Olathe uh, for all of our participants. Uh, if you can stay on camera, that would be best. But if you have some reservations about being recorded on Zoom, uh, we understand. Uh, please uh, mute your microphone while Dr. Lyon gives his, um, his presentation. Uh, I will let you know that uh, Dr. Lyon is a clinical associate professor and clinical skills coordinator at the College of Veterinary Medicine in Manhattan at K-State, at K-State uh, University. So uh, he has a diploma of American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine for small animal treatment. And he has a doctor of veterinary medicine from Oklahoma State. So we are pleased that you have uh, decided to join us today. Uh, Dr. Lyon, and I hope I will go ahead and turn it over to you to go ahead and give your presentation. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, thank you for those that are able to attend today. Um, I hope this is something fun and exciting for you. So I was asked to give just a little brief background on um, what drew me to veterinary medicine and why I wanted to be a veterinarian. So for me, I was a little bit atypical. Um, yes, I like animals, but that wasn't the primary reason that I got pulled into uh, veterinary medicine. Uh, my major reason for, for being here was um, I like I just like medicine in general. So I was really torn in high school. Do I go to vet school or do I go to medical school? And I started working for the local veterinarian and very much enjoyed every aspect <clears throat> of that. And then ultimately that led me to college and undergrad and eventually veterinary school was where I where I landed. So um, pretty exciting. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will get started here with my presentation, maybe. Um, let's do this one more time. Make sure I share the right thing. Okay. That one, that's the one I wanted to share. All right, so um, can everybody see my screen, I'm hoping? Yes, we can see yes. it. Yes, okay, good. Let me pull up my chat window here so I can see if there's anything that pops up in the chat. Okay. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about some minimally invasive techniques that we have to correct uh, for urinary tract problems. And there's a whole bunch of these that we can do. Um, the first question that I wanted to try to answer for the group was actually, when I say minimally invasive, what does that mean? What are minimally invasive procedures? Um, there's a growing field in human medicine and in veterinary medicine on this concept of minimally invasive procedures. And there's many of them. It's not just urinary related. A good example of this is as a person, if you have to have your gallbladder removed, historically, it would be a surgery. They would cut you open and take your gallbladder out. Um, now, instead of doing that, um, they're more likely to do it laparoscopically. So they're more likely to, to do it with the use of these little trocars um, and cameras. So instead of having a big incision, you have two or three little puncture holes in your abdomen. Um, and that allows them to remove your gallbladder with tiny little incisions. And that's kind of the direction that we're going in veterinary medicine as well. There's a lot of potential benefits for it. You heal faster, your incision's smaller, your scar is smaller, um, your whole rate of recovery is faster, you know, lots of pros. So that's kind of where we're headed. So with regards to urinary procedures or procedures involving the kidneys and the bladder specifically, um, what, what can we currently do in veterinary medicine? Um, these are the things I'm going to touch on today. So incontinence or dribbling of urine, um, we see fairly commonly in dogs, and there's some methods we have to help minimize or correct that. <clears throat> Ectopic ureters, which we'll talk about more detail later on, um, using a laser to correct those. Uh, urinary stone management, so bladder stones, kidney stones, all those things can be managed minimally invasively in this day and age. And then lastly, cancer. Um, we do see bladder cancer in dogs. <clears throat> and in addition to giving chemotherapy or radiation therapy for those, there's also some uh, minimally invasive uh, techniques that we have to try to help prolong their survival and make them more comfortable while they have their cancer. 
So let's start with uh, spay and continence. So <clears throat> um, fairly common problem that we see in dogs, particularly in large dogs. So depending on the literature that you read, somewhere between 5% to 20% of all female dogs will develop incontinence at some point in their life. That's much higher in large breeds. So this is not gonna be your little teacup poodle or your little chihuahua kind of a problem. This is gonna be your Doberman, Labrador, Golden Retriever sort of problem uh, most commonly. Now, timing for when this starts in these patients varies quite a bit. Um, it can be as soon as a few weeks after they're spayed, but much more likely it's gonna be around three years um, after their spay or longer. So some dogs will not develop incontinence until they're older in life. So eight, eight nine, 10 years old, somewhere in that range. <clears throat> There is some complex reasons for why this happens. So when we spay dogs, we remove their uterus, we also remove their ovaries. Ovaries are a source of estrogen or hormone, and when they have decreased amounts of estrogen, the theory is that they have um, less amounts of uh, these collagenous support structures. So you have collagen that's built around your urethra um, as you take away the estrogen in some patients that collagen becomes a little bit thinner. And because it's a little bit thinner, there's just not a lot of structural support for the, for the urethra, which is the tube that carries urine from the bladder to the outside of the body. And when that happens, they're no longer able to hold their urine and therefore they start to leak. Um, this is also a, a somewhat fairly common problem in humans as well, particularly seen in women, um, more, more specifically older women um, start to have some incontinence issues, but anybody can develop incontinence. Same thing is true with dogs, males, females, anybody can develop incontinence. It just happens to be more frequent in females, especially older female dogs. The good news is the majority of these patients can be managed with medication. So they don't need surgery, they don't need anything. Somewhere between 80, 90% of, of dogs will respond to just medications. They don't need anything else. But there is gonna be that group of patients that fail medical therapy. And when they fail medical therapy, this can be devastating for this patient. Most people are not gonna be tolerant of a dog that's leaking urine, particularly when it's leaking urine in the house. So if you have a dog that's laying on, the, on your white carpet or laying on your sofa and now they're dribbling urine um, because they can't control their urine anymore, that's a big reason for euthanasia in older animals, unless we can get that under control. <clears throat> so let's talk about Scarlett. Scarlett was a case that um, I had seen in the past, and she was a three-year, eight-month-old spade female, uh, Doberman Pinscher. And she came in to see us for incontinence, and she kept having urinary tract infections. And the urinary tract infections goes hand in hand with incontinence. So if patients that are leaking um, urine, they're more likely to get bacteria that climb up into the urethra and into their bladder. <clears throat> she had put, been put on appropriate medications for her incontinence and they weren't working for her. Um, so she was still having some breakthrough incontinence issues. <clears throat> so let's talk about the old method, the surgical method. So historically what's been done <laughs> for these patients to correct their incontinence is a surgical procedure. So in this bottom diagram here is a, a, a drawing of how this surgery would look. So there's an incision that is made um, in the dog's abdomen. This would be the bladder. So the bladder is pulled a little bit forward. Um, and then there are some sutures or stitches that are gonna be placed um, actually in the vagina. And so here's a bone, the pelvis bone um, or your hip bone. Um, this small structure here would be the urethra and then this slightly larger structure is gonna be the vagina. And what we do is historically we take and suture the vagina to the um, pelvic bone and kind of sandwich or layer um, that urethra between it and apply a little bit of pressure. So when we apply a little bit of pressure that helps to close down the urethra and helps prevent those patients from becoming incontinent. Incontinent. So <clears throat> this really is kind of a Goldilocks amount of tension. If you get it too tight, if you squish it too much, they're not able to urinate through it at all. Um, but if you don't get it tight enough after the surgery, they can still be incontinent. So there was, it's definitely a, a trick um, of the surgeon to be able to get that to the right level. So what can we do instead? Um, we can do collagen injections. This procedure is done in human patients as well. Um, and basically what we do is we take uh, collagen, just like you would have injected in your lips if you live in California, right? You wanna have nice big luscious lips. Um, you can have some bovine cross-linked collagen material attached to a needle. 
um, we will then take a scope or a camera and we drive from the outside, so up the urethra into the bladder, and then we pass a needle um, and inject these little blebs of collagen here, um, right in the urethra, right at the neck of the bladder. So if this is the bladder, we try to put our collagen injections really close to the bladder, just at the very, very start of the urethra. And this is what it looks like. This is our goal. We want to have almost like a Mercedes sign, right? Um, so we want to have three little blebs of collagen that are injected. So this is what it looks like when we're injecting. This is what we want it to look like when we're finished. Um, and I have a video of this that we did for Scarlett. So this is Scarlett. And just to, to orient you where we are, um, if we continue going past this structure, this, and this is my needle. If we continue going past here, we're going to end up in the urinary bladder. So all of this tissue around here is the very start of her urethra. So when I start this video, what we're going to see is um, here's the needle that's going into uh, a portion of her urethra. So you can't see the injection itself. The injection's already happened but you'll be able to see that white collagen material come through the clear portion of the syringe and needle um, down into her urethra. And we'll see that start to swell up and take up um, some space. So here we see the blebbing. Um, you can see that collagen now being deposited underneath the uh, mucosa or that thin superficial layer that's lining the, the urethra or the opening of where your urine is gonna pass from your bladder to the outside world. Um, and all we do is just create three little blebs. So this would be one of those blebs. There's already another one that's been injected up in this location. We would do one more over here and then we would be done for this dog. So what are the advantages to this? Um, Scarlett went home the same day. This whole procedure took us about 30 minutes to complete. So she had to have a little bit of anesthesia we injected some collagen and urethra. No incisions, absolutely no bleeding. When she woke up, she was no longer leaking urine um, and a whole bunch of reduced potential for complications, including infections, bleeding, um, chances of damaging her urethra, cutting something, causing nerve damage, something that we don't want to do. Um, so this is a relatively short, minimally invasive procedure um, that has a significant positive impact on patients. <clears throat> All right, ectopic ureters. So this is a different problem. So we're gonna go through some basic anatomy here uh, in just a second, but really what this is, is the ureter is positioned in an improper place. So your kidneys make urine. The kidneys are connected by a tube to the bladder. That tube is called the ureter. So that, that tube should run from the kidney to the bladder to a very specific location on the bladder. It should open up into the bladder so that whenever you're making urine, that urine is draining into your bladder and your bladder holds it in between episodes of urination. So this is a birth defect. Patients are born with abnormally located ureters. And what we see in these patients is because it's a birth defect, they leak urine from the time they're born. So as a day one puppy, these guys are leaking urine all the time. So just to review normal anatomy, um, we'll kind of start back over here. Here's our kidneys. Here's our bladder down here. So these tubes, which there should be one for the left kidney, one for the right kidney, are the ureter. So they should go from the kidney down to the bladder to make everything connect. So where it should terminate is right in here. So a normal ureter is gonna come all the way down to this area of the bladder called the trigone, and it's gonna actually open up inside the bladder. Um, this one's not normal. This one's opening up in the, in the urethra. It shouldn't go this far down. And if we were to scope a patient and look inside their bladder, this is what we would see. So this is where the ureter should open inside the bladder. And if you watch that video loop there, you can see little jets of urine that are coming out. So um, here was a little jet of urine. There was another little jet of urine right there at the end. And that's what we're hoping to see in a normal patient. So those ureters are gonna dump right into the bladder and you should see that kidney making urine on that side. <clears throat> So what happens when they're abnormal? Um, basically, these ureters don't connect to the bladder in the normal location. What they do instead is they track um, too far out. So this would be the abnormal ureter. So it should open right here in the bladder. And instead, what it's doing is it's going down to that location. It's going partway through the bladder. And then it's tracking um, way out into the urethra. And then it's opening up. So the thing that's important about this is 
in the normal ureter, it's gonna open up in the bladder. This is gonna be the sphincter or the muscle that helps you hold your urine in between urination. So if, if that ureter opens up beyond this sphincter, which is what happens in patients with ectopic ureters, they can't control it. So the opening is beyond the, the door. So the door is closed, but the opening is beyond the door and they have no control over that. So the good news is, is that we're able to fix this um, with a couple of different ways. So this is Mackenzie. When I saw her originally, she was a four month old um, Labrador retriever and she presented for incontinence. Um, we diagnosed her with an ectopic ureter. So the previous method to treat this, the surgical method, is a little bit complicated. So you'll um, open them up with surgery. So they'll cut through their skin and through their abdomen, find their bladder. So this would be the bladder. You make an incision into the bladder. Over here on your left is a normal opening, the one that we saw in that first video, normal opening. This one kind of comes down here and opens up. So the surgeon had to make a new opening. So they've made a, an incision or a hole inside this ureter. This is just a catheter plastic tube that's passed in there. And you can see they've got little stitches all the way around this to try to make a new opening. Um, and then this is the side view of this same picture. So here's that little plastic tube. They are then gonna put some sutures or stitches around the old abnormal tube and try to close that off. Um, that's one method. The other method is you just cut the abnormal ureter, just cut it. And now you have a, a new tube um, and you're just going to insert that into the bladder in a different location. So you just cut it and re-implant it because it's abnormal down here. Um, so that would be the method to, to correct that. So this is what the actual surgery looks like. So here's the bladder. Here's the incision into the bladder. Here's some of our surgical instruments. Um, here's all our little stitches going all the way around the ureter because this ureter has now been re-implanted back into the urinary bladder where it's supposed to be. So then the next steps for the surgeon is they're going to have to sew or suture this bladder closed, put the bladder back in the abdomen, close up the muscle, close up the underlying tissues, and then close up the skin, right? So big surgery to get that accomplished. So options that we can do um, minimally invasively is um, what we've done here is I'm scoping, we'll start the image on the left. I'm scoping this dog. So the camera is sitting inside the urethra. And if I were to go up over this little fold of tissue um, and go right down this crevice um, where the black arrow is, I would end up in this dog's bladder. So here's her bladder. If I follow the white arrow, I'm going to end up going up her ureter. And then this would be her kidney up here. And so this is the ureter and this was the bladder. So the camera or the scope is way down here. It's off the screen. You can't see it. Um, but you can tell that this ureter goes way too far. It should open up in here and it's not. It's opening up way, way back here. So what we're going to do to fix that is we're going to use a laser to cut this tissue or resect this tissue back from the abnormal location in the, in the urethra and come all the way back up to the bladder where it's supposed to be. So to orient you, what we've got here, um, this is just a plastic catheter um, that I'm just using to protect the patient from the laser. So this red light here is the laser. Um, and this is the plastic coating that's over the laser filament. So the benefit of the laser is you'll see when I hit play is the laser is going to cut this tissue, but it's also going to cauterize it or burn it. So there's no bleeding. There's absolutely no bleeding with this procedure. Um, so we'll see what happens when we, when we watch this. So there I am cutting, cauterizing that tissue um, dissecting that abnormal tissue back from where it shouldn't be back to a more correct anatomic location. So now we're just looking inside the bladder there. So you can see this laser is just going to make a nice smooth little cut and dissect everything back. Um, pretty simple, pretty easy to do. Again, no blood, um, no incisions. All this is done with a camera that's driven up the urethra. Um, so what are the benefits? This dog went home the next day. It took about two hours for us to laser ablate her ureter. She had absolutely no bleeding. There was no incision. It was virtually painless because you don't really have pain receptors on the inside lining of your bladder. You have pain receptors in your skin for sure. You have pain receptors in your muscle, but you don't really have pain receptors in that location. So we're able just to dissect that back. 
Um, when she woke up, remember she had been incontinent or leaking urine since the time she was born. When she woke up, she was able to hold her urine. She wasn't incontinent anymore. And because there were no incisions or anything else, um, we didn't have any risk or as big of a risk for infection. Um, we didn't have any scar tissue formation. We didn't have any risk of urine leaking from where we sewed the bladder clothes into her abdomen or causing adhesions or where things are gonna stick together inside the bladder. So all those things were eliminated. Bladder stones and kidney stones. Um, stones ha happen a lot in people and in dogs as well. Cats, rabbits, horses. Um, there's a lot of animals that get stones. Um, <clears throat> we don't really know how they're formed. There's been a lot of research that's gone into this, both on the human side and on the veterinary side, and we really don't understand them. We know that there are combinations of organic material like proteins, and then also some inorganic materials like salts, calcium, oxalate, um, you know, magnesium, phosphorus, different compounds that are made into those. Um, calcium and phosphorus are also found in your bones. That's what makes your bones hard. So these combinations of things tend to make stones and depending on what they're made of, they can form all sorts of fun shapes. So this is a typical appearance for a silica stone. It has this jackstone kind of appearance. Um, these weird angular triangular kind of shaped stones are pretty classic for struvite. Um, people tend to form um, calcium oxalate stones. Cats tend to form calcium oxalate stones. This is a, a rabbit bladder stone. It's made out of carbonate. So lots and lots of stones from lots of animals. Now, <clears throat> here are some x-rays or radiographs of animals that have stones. So just to kind of orient you, here's some legs on this animal. Here's the tail. Here's the animal's hip. Here's the spine, um, ribs coming down here. So what we're looking at are these guys. These are all stones that are sitting in the bladder. Um, same thing here, stones that are sitting in this cat's bladder. Here's a stone sitting in this cat's bladder. And then here's a bunch of poop in this cat's colon. This cat needs to poop really bad. Um, but we're not worried about that. We're worried about that stone that's right there in the bladder. So the standard historical correction for these, um, which is still done in tons of veterinary practices all across the US and it works fine, is surgery. So open them up, take a scalpel blade, open them up, open up their bladder and then get all the stones out. So this bladder is just chock full of stones. Same thing with this one, just full of stones. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in on that just so you can appreciate it more. So many stones, stones are cascading out of that bladder and into this bowl uh, where they're being collected. So many stones. Um, we use a spoon, just, just like this. This is a bladder spoon. Um, once we make the incision in the bladder, we start pulling out the stones and then you take the spoon in there and you kind of scrape everything and try to get all the stones out. And then when you're done, you have to sew it up. And so that's what that would look like. Here's a bladder that's got a bunch of stitches going across it because um, that bladder has now had all its stones removed. Notice how much, how much blood is here. And that's pretty normal um, for most of these surgeries. These stones cause a lot of irritation and inflammation to the bladder, which means the bladder is gonna bleed more than it typically would. So this is quite a bit of bleeding um, with this bladder. And then when it's all said and done, um, there's stitches, a decent sized incision on the outside of this critter. Um, so pretty big, uh, pretty big hole with a bunch of stitches in it. it looks like Frankenstein. All right, so what are the other options? There's a couple. Um, this one is called PCCL for short, which is an abbreviation for this mouthful of words, uh, percutaneous systolithotomy. And what we do here is we make a tiny little bitty, no wider than the width of your finger, so just a tiny little hole. Um, we then take a metal trocar and we put that down through the skin, so through the hole we just made, into the urinary bladder. Um, we then use a scope that has a camera on it in a basket and we go in there and pull the stones out. So here's what it looks like. So here we're looking into the bladder. We can see the stones down in the bladder. So here's our, our basket tool. So we'll pass that basket down in there. We'll grab these stones and we'll pull them up through this metal tube. And then when it's all said and done, we just have to put one or two stitches inside the bladder uh, and then one or two stitches in the skin and we're done, right? So it's a really short procedure. <clears throat> So advantages uh, of this technique over surgery, well, obviously the incision is gonna be a whole lot smaller. The amount of bleeding is gonna be a whole lot less with that. From a time standpoint, it takes about the same amount of time. 
The other potential advantage we have with this is we can see better. So with that scope, with that camera, everything on the screen is magnified by 40 times. So a little tiny stone is now 40 times bigger for us to see. Um, there have been a lot of studies looking at bladder stone surgeries in dogs. And for dogs that have more than one stone, that have multiple stones, about 20% of patients will come out of the operating room and they'll still have stones in their bladder because we didn't get them all because we couldn't see them very well. There's a lot of blood in the way. And we're using a spoon, remember, to get in there and scrape stuff out. Um, versus with this technique, the second technique, we're using a camera. So we're in there and we can actually see what we're doing a lot better. And we have a better chance of getting rid of all of the stones that are in the bladder. So this is a nice technique to be able to do this. The other thing that's really critical for many of these patients is things like suture material. So this is a piece of, a piece of suture that we would have used to close the bladder up. Notice it's embedded in this stone. And we see that all the time too. So if a dog or a cat has bladder surgery and we have some suture that's in their bladder to close up the hole we made, that suture that's sticking in there tends to start to form a, st a stone on top of it in some of these patients. So it serves as a nidus or a catalyst for those stones to form. So we don't want that, that's bad. Another option is, again, we can use our friend the laser. Um, so a little bit different laser than we had with the, with the ectopic ureter. This is a homium YAG laser. And what we can do is use these stones to go in and fragment or break apart um, stones that are too big and into these smaller chunks. So think about it like a like crushing up ice um, and taking out chunks of the of the bigger cube to make it smaller crushed ice so you can pull all the small chunks out or flush the small chunks out. So if the um, stone is too big to go through that metal tube that we put in the bladder, we can break it apart with a laser and pull out the fragments. That's one way to do it. Um, or this works great. And what I'm picturing here is this is a this is a bull. Um, that uh, had a stone in his urethra, so he couldn't urinate. The stone was causing a blockage. And I was able to go in with a, uh, a laser and break that stone apart, remove the fragments, and then he was able to urinate afterwards. Same thing with this one. So this is a goat. Um, again, I'm a small animal internist, but I have the skill set that I was able to bring over to the barn and help with the bull and help with the goat. Um, but here's a goat, his name was Snow. And this is the patient, this is me doing the procedure, this is my scope camera, and then this is just a magnified um, camera view of what was showing up on this screen. So there's the laser, start to turn on the laser and you can see chunks of that stone breaking off. And then what may be difficult to see is I'm working way back here, so I have a camera attached to my head um, so I can record this, but I'm working way back here on the back end of this goat and I've got a camera up his urethra. Um, and I'm able to um, see that stone, use a laser and break that stone apart into smaller pieces and remove those pieces and um, resolve his urinary blockage. Sometimes stones don't form in the bladder. So down here is the bladder. Sometimes these stones form up in the kidney. Um, so stones that are in the kidney can oftentimes, not always, but sometimes will drift down into the ureter. Remember that was the tube that connected the kidney to the bladder. So if those stones kind of move down into that tube, they could block that tube. And then that kidney on that particular side or both sides stops working because it can't produce urine. It can't get the urine from the bladder or from the kidney to the bladder. <clears throat> So Piper had this problem. She was a nine-year-old uh, spade female French bulldog. She came in to see us because she wasn't feeling well at home. She wasn't eating, she was throwing up. She had a fever and she had a stone in her ureter. Um, so typical correction for this is again, our friend surgery. So with surgery, we're gonna make a big old incision. So huge incision. Um, the kidneys are located way at the back. So they're not on the, we normally make our, our cuts or incision into the abdomen right from the, from the tummy, from the front part. Um, and these kidneys are located way back by the spine in the very back of the animal. So you have to move all this stuff out of the way and then dig back there and find the kidney and then find the tube, the ureter that you're looking for. So if this was our ureter that's got a stone in it, the dotted line is where we're gonna make an incision. So we'll make an incision into that tube and these tubes are small. So these tubes are about the diameter of a pencil, no bigger than that. They're tiny, they are thin, tiny tubes. 
And then after you get the stone out, you have to sew all that hole back up um, and get it removed. So the concerns we have with most of this is going to be leaking of urine um, from the ureter into the abdomen where these little stitches are. If you don't get everything closed up watertight, um, so instead, what we can do is place a stent. So this is Piper, and what we did for her, um, which I'll show you in just a second, is we put this artificial, this man-made tube inside her ureter. So it goes all the way up here to the level of her kidney. Here's her stone right there. It's hard to see, but there's her stone. And this tube runs all the way down to the bladder. So I didn't take the stone out, but all I did was put a tube inside her ureter so that she could still drain urine from that side and it wouldn't cause a blockage uh, because of that stone. So this is what we're looking at. Um, I've got a scope up her urethra sitting in her urinary bladder. Uh, this is a wire that's going inside her ureter. So if I right in here is her urinary bladder, this is just the opening to the ureter. Here is a fluoroscopy image, or it's a reverse x-ray, but it's a video x-ray. So this is her, she's laying on her back, here's her spine. And then there's the little stone right there, uh, right there. So let me see if I can actually circle that. There we go, there's her stone. <clears throat> um, step one, we're going to pass a wire. So here's a wire, I got that wire past her stone. Um, so that wire now goes, here's the stone, past the stone all the way up to the kidney, all right? Um, we then use that wire as a guide wire and we feed our little stent. So here's our little double pigtailed um, stent that's now looped up inside the kidney on this side. Here's still the stone sitting there. Um, and then here's the, the other end of the um, stent sitting in her urinary bladder. And then here is what it looks like from the um, scope side. So inside of her urinary bladder, I can see this little pigtail, which is which is down in here. Um, so that's when we're done, finished. She's got her new stent in. <clears throat> so again, advantages, 45 minute procedure time, zero incisions for this dog. Um, I didn't take the stone out, didn't need to take the stone out. We were able to get that blockage relieved. There was no risk of us um, not closing her ureter completely and causing her to leak urine into her abdomen and having more difficulties after surgery. And she went home the next day. I mean, this was a, a really, really short procedure for her, uh, faster than the surgeon could do it, right? So quick, easy, um, no muss, no fuss. <clears throat> All right, tumors. Um, dogs, unfortunately, can develop bladder cancer. So just to orient you here, kidneys, here were our, our ureters, again, those tubes that connect them. Um, so they should open up right here where the bladder and the urethra all kind of come together. So this area is called the trigone anatomically. Um, and this is where bladder tumors almost always start in dogs. And if they start here and they grow this direction, they don't cause as many problems as they do if they start here and they grow this direction. So if they grow here and there's a tumor sitting right there in the urethra, that dog won't be able to get any urine out of her bladder. Um, it'll be completely blocked. So <clears throat> um, the next slide is going to be an ultrasound image. And before I get to that, I wanted to um, see if I can draw out what it is we're gonna be looking at. So the dog that I'm gonna show you next, her tumor is sort of sitting right in here. Um, so just right inside her urethra where the green pin is now colored. Um, and she is not gonna be able um, to urinate because whoops, there's gonna be no way for her um, urine that's in her bladder to get past this tumor and then out through her body. <clears throat> So this is an ultrasound image. This is Sadie. She was a 12-year-old female spade Maltese uh, poodle mixed dog, and she has had trouble urinating for three months. Um, and if we look at this, this would be her a portion of her urethra. If we continue this direction, you would see her bladder sort of sitting out here, right? This is where the bladder would be. Um, <clears throat> and then here's her tumor. So this whole thing is a tumor that is effectively completely blocking the out um, pathway. So urine should travel this direction to get out of Sadie, and this tumor is sitting in the way, causing all sorts of problems. 
Um, so what do we do for that? Well, this old surgical method, which still works great, there's not a problem with it, is we can go in and put a tube in them. So again, we make an incision, we find the bladder. Once we find the bladder, we put this tube in it. Um, so now there's a tube going into the bladder. We then poke that tube through the skin and we close everything up. So when this dog wakes up from surgery, this dog's gonna have a tube sticking out of her belly um, that's going into her bladder. And then the owner would attach a syringe um, to this tube, you know, four or five, six times a day. And with a syringe, drain the urine that's in her bladder out of her bladder because um, she couldn't pee through her urethra. Her urethra was completely blocked. And then after this um, incision here completely heals, we're able to take out this really long tube and put in a little bit of short, low profile tube. So on this one, this has a little cap on it. This little cap un pops open and the owner can attach a syringe to that and then remove um, urine from the dog or cat's uh, bladder to, to remove um, all that urine that's there since they're unable to urinate. So that's the older method. The minimally invasive method is to place a stent inside the urethra. So this is very, very similar to if you know somebody that had a heart attack and they put a stent inside their coronary artery. Um, that stent is just going to be a little metal device just like this. So this is a, a stainless steel. Um, it is a single piece that's cut. It's laser cut. It looks like chain link fence. Um, and they're just made a lot smaller to go inside your heart, inside the blood vessels that feed your heart. If you need, have a heart attack, you need to have a stent placed in there, but it's the same concept. Um, so stent, but now we're just going to put it in the urethra. So here's what that looks like. So just to orient you again, here's the dog's legs. This is the dog's pelvis. This is the dog's tail. It's not wagging because she's under anesthesia. Um, here is her uh, spine. And then this thing that's black here is the urinary bladder. So I've got a wire that's coming up her urethra, past the tumor, into the bladder. We've got contrast in the bladder so you can see it well. Um, and then as we pull the um, wire back, we're injecting contrast here. And you should. I can get the, there we go. You should be able to see that there's a filling defect. So what I mean by that is um, this is where the urethra is. It should be that diameter. So that width of where the contrast is, but then it completely disappears in this location. And then it starts to appear here again. And this little hollowed out piece is still part of her tumor. So all of this is tumor. The tumor extends all the way down here. And then her urethra starts to become a little bit more normal right at the sort of the back of her pelvis there. So what we did was next, we're gonna place a stent. So just to orient you in this image, again, here's her bladder. Um, this is the actual stent and I've started to open it up. So when we pass it, it's closed. We pass it closed into the bladder. We open it up or bird beak it and then we pull it back um, into where it starts to make contact with the tumor. And then we open the whole thing up. Um, so this is what that would look like, pulling that back. Um, getting it well seated, and then we start to open the stent, and you can see the stent deploying um, here. So here's the stent deploying right there, and filling, opening that tumor up, um, and then when it's all said and done, uh, we have, should have a nice um, open urethra um, that's going to have a much better pathway for urine for this dog so that she's able to urinate normally and not have to have a tube permanently implanted inside her abdomen. And then this last image is after we placed the stent, we drove up the urethra and um, took pictures with the scope. So here's the stent, all this pale looking tissue around here is her tumor, but we went in, into the tumor and then opened it up. So popped it open um, enough that she's able to urinate. Short procedure took about 30 minutes, very, very quick, very easy. Again, no incision, no bleeding. Um, did I cure her of her tumor? Absolutely not. Does she still need to have chemotherapy or radiation therapy or something to try to deal with her tumor? Yes, she does. 
um, but this is going to help buy her some time for those other therapies to work and to try to shrink the tumor down. Um, and some of these guys can do quite well, so they can have they can survive for several years um, if they are in that group of patients that respond to chemotherapy and or radiation therapy. Um, but she would not have been able to survive if we if she couldn't pee. Um, so her only options were either a stent or to have a tube permanently placed into her bladder. That's it. Those are the only options. So in summary, um, veterinary medicine is now on the brink of doing some really cool stuff uh, with patients. And these are just the urinary procedures. There are a whole host of spinal procedures, airway procedures, vascular procedures. Uh, we don't see heart attacks in dogs and cats, so we don't typically put stents in, in the heart but we put stents in other vessels as well. Um, you can deliver targeted chemotherapy to just the tumor itself through some of these procedures. So tremendous, tremendous possibility depending on um, your interest and, and uh, what you're able to do with your career. But this is an excellent time um, to try to get into veterinary medicine because there's so many possibilities for you. Um, the other thing that's really cool is these patients have really quick recovery times and every owner that we've ever had elect to go through one of these minimally invasive procedures has just been thrilled with the outcome. Um, <clears throat> so at this point, I will try to answer any questions that you have. And I see that there are a few that are in the chat window. So let's pull this open. Oh, that's good. So I happened to answer that one. Thank you, Jamie. So what if the stone is bigger than the trocar? And that one, we can actually laser it apart. So I did answer that one. Good. At least I didn't overlook that one. What other questions do you have? And at this point, any of our participants are welcome to unmute their button and go ahead and, and just ask us live. Um, I always wonder if this is um, a procedure that you're doing, you, you do have less risk of infection. That's because uh, you're not as invasive. Mm -hmm. um, it, it looks like a, a really good um, alternative to, yeah. to surgery. Yep. And I'm not a surgeon. In fact, I'm the opposite of a surgeon. My goal in my career has been to try to keep patients out of the operating room. Um, and this is one of the ways that we do that. Mm -hmm. I saw Jamie laughing. She knows I'm not a surgeon. <laughs> While others are coming up with questions, uh, Dr. Lyon, do you want to tell us about translational medicine? I have a real interest in One Health. Uh, is there some carryover between animal health and human health? It's a good question. And the short answer is yes. There, there is a tremendous amount of overlap um, in those areas. I think veterinary medicine it's, it's just not as well funded as human medicine. It's harder to get grant dollars to do research. And so what tends to happen is our colleagues in human medicine are able to um, get more money for research and therefore they tend to do a lot of pioneering experience. Um, and then we translate what they do into veterinary patients. Now that's not always true because sometimes in human medicine, they use animals as models, right? So they'll use dogs or cats for models of specific diseases. Um, they will use monkeys uh, or pigs as models for specific diseases. And the other cool part of that research aspect is there are veterinarians that spend their entire career um, only working with researchers and their interest there is um, like let's say that it's a it's an MD and MDs are doing a research product project on a specific disease but they're using an animal model um, well as part of their research component they have to have veterinarians that are there to help oversee the health and welfare of those animals so those veterinarians are still involved in that research piece um, veterinarians are peppered throughout all of those research projects because they have to be medical doctors cannot do it on their own and then with regards to One Health, um, for those that are unfamiliar with that term, One Health is um, drawing connections between human health, animal health, and the environment. And um, critical, critical piece of just the world as a whole. 
Uh, there are so many diseases that pass between people and animals or animals and people and the environment, toxins, um, all those things, plastic in the oceans, all those things are going to impact not just uh, not just the environment itself, but the animals that live in that environment, and then ultimately the people that also cohabitate in that environment. So One Health is a huge piece of what veterinarians do every day. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a general practitioner spaying and neutering animals, providing rabies vaccines and general health updates, or you're uh, working as a veterinarian in the swine industry, or you're working as a veterinarian in research, or you're working as a veterinarian in a teaching hospital. Um, every aspect of what we do touches on One Health in some way, shape, or form. I'm putting a link in the chat because we do have a One Health Day. Uh, okay. There was a reason I asked that. <laughs> There's a good segue. Uh, we do have an opportunity for students and uh, teachers to attend free of charge at the One Health Day celebration that we're going to have at the KU Edwards campus. Uh, it's a collaboration between KU Med, K-State and KU Edwards campus. Um, but you also have an opportunity to get a scholarship. So mm -hmm. if you're interested in doing a poster presentation, uh, they are accepting, uh, there's a link on that. If you go through that link, you can get there and find out. It'd be great to have you um, actually do a poster presentation. And that goes for undergraduates, Ms. Gray, and also uh, graduate students. So that, that opportunity is there for uh, students from high school on up. Sorry, put, had to put in the plug. Have we got other questions about, has anybody had a, uh, a pet who has actually had that type of complication? And this kind of rings true. Has anybody ever had a pet with bladder stones? That's probably the most common thing that we would see. Is it working? Oh, okay. Yeah. I've had a pet with um, bladder stones and also a different pet with urinary incontinence. So I'm familiar with those at least. Excellent. Can you imagine what comfort then the animal goes through after that procedure uh, to be able to urinate normally. I can't imagine being incontinent and not being able to control and being very embarrassed. I mean, as a dog, I would still be embarrassed. <laughs> they are. They're always really embarrassed. They feel bad about it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Well, unless we have any other questions, I... Uh, I think maybe we'll let you go a little early, Dr. Lyon. Um, are you sure there are no questions? You can always contact me uh, at K-State and I can get you Dr. Lyon's uh, contact information. But we appreciate everyone showing up today and learning about this very important topic. Thank you, Dr. Lyon. Oh, and it's in the chat. Thank you for getting yep. that contact Absolutely. info. Feel so free to email me anytime. All right. Well, thank you so very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.